Welcome, Deb. It's nice to have you. you back with us. Um, we just did this uh, two years ago. And it, one of the things that struck me is um, you said then um, about the Executive Council, this body was never supposed to be political. Um, but where do you think that stands now? Um, and how does it affect your approach to being a counselor? So I still believe that it was never supposed to be political. It has never been political up until the last couple of years when I joined the council again in 2018. Um, for the most part, it remains unpolitical. The counselors try to not get involved in policy making. Our job is not policymakers, the Senate and the House do that. So we're supposed to um, do what the legislature tells us to do, spend money where they have agreed that money should be spent. Um, but I can tell you that because in large part the appointments of this governor, he feels it has become political. Um, I think that we are just doing our jobs in terms of vetting the candidates that the governor brings to us. So uh, a lot of um, that, uh, the job of uh, executive council is not um, uh, revolving around policy making and ideological issues. Um, and in, in the past few elections, and particularly this year, um, in the primaries, it, it seemed that all of the uh, stumping, all of the advertising, all of the discussion uh, from the candidates uh, has revolved around that um, issues um, of, of climate change and workers' rights and you know family leave and uh, you know wage inequality. Um, how does that sit with you, and, and and how does it affect how you work on the council? Are are so, you is that okay? So for the most part, I try to stay out of those arguments. I have enough to do doing the job of the council, and, and I know you, you know what the job is, but um, I am not involved in the policy making, and, um, and that's fine with me. I was in the House and the Senate for 15 years, and I had my share of policy making, and I love that, you know, especially when I was able to advocate for environmental issues and for children's issues and women's rights and domestic violence, but I mostly try to stay out of those issues. I have my feelings about uh, them, um, but I have more than I can handle uh, doing my job than get involved in policy making. And so I have tried over the years I've been on the council to, as much as I can, avoid going to the House and the Senate to testify on bills that I feel strongly about. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I just have tried not to do that. Okay, so I know you're saying great things and they're pearls of I, wisdom. I am okay. saying great things. <laughs> I, if only you had heard what I had to say. Oh um, boy, so, I'm not a lip reader, but <laughs> tell me. <laughs> so uh, kind of along the, the same lines, um, you, you, when we interviewed you last time, you had you said that you were uh, generally optimistic, um, uh, but that uh, in terms of civility in politics, um, you'd kind of come to a point where maybe that optimism was tempered somewhat, and that was one of the reasons that you uh, stepped back in. Um, to run. And, and so I'm wondering two years later after being in the uh, position, 
again. Uh, what are your feelings about civility and, and where we are in New Hampshire uh, and state government in that regard? I think we're in a sorry place, uh, not necessarily on the council because the councilors all treat each other civilly. And in our meetings, we seem to be really civil. We disagree, we ask questions with um, the exception of one counselor. Most people keep their um, emotions in check most of the time. So we remain a fairly civil body. And maybe it's because there are five of us counselors, but I honestly like at least three of the other counselors and sometimes the fourth one. <laughs> and, and even though we disagree on a lot of the votes that we make, we can still call each other and have a discussion about something else that's going on. And I am an optimist. I generally am an optimist, but I tell you, our country is in a sorry state and our state legislature um, is not in a good place. Um, I, I put a lot of this blame on our governor. Um, and, you know, I think the way he behaves and the lack of communication, especially with us counselors, makes for a difficult situation. We can't have a discussion, a back and forth. Um, and that makes it very difficult. For example, um, in working with past governors, um, there has always been a discussion when the governor wants to bring, say, a judicial nominee or a nominee to head an important state agency. There's been a discussion. There's been a notification. Um, I'm thinking about bringing this person forward. What are your thoughts? Um, do you have any suggestions um, of who might be good? Uh, there is none of that going on now. And when I have tried to reach out to offer a suggestion, it has not been received well. Uh, for example, uh, the Supreme Court Chief Justice nomination that came before us last year. Um, I, I met with the governor as a, uh, a courtesy. I went up and had a discussion with him because I knew that the votes were not there for this individual to be a justice and a chief justice. But I had someone in mind who I had been vetting and I felt that this individual could, after a fair hearing, garner a five to nothing vote on the council. And this person is a moderate, not, you know, to one side or another. And so, but this, the governor was not at all willing to look at this individual or discuss, discuss it. So is, but you have to, <laughs> but you have to work with the governor. Um, so is that, uh, it, that goes both ways, right? Is that, is the civility not there to, to have a, uh, a good working relationship? Uh, I would like to. I've always gotten along with every other governor that I've worked with in my years in the House and the Senate um, and on the council, with the exception of one other governor um, who is related to this governor. <laughs> okay. Um. Um, I, I would like there to be a civil discussion. I think perhaps if there is a democratic majority on the council this time, maybe there might be more of a willingness to listen to what we have to say, to work with us, to have a discussion, have a back and forth. I think this governor might be hoping for a completely different council next time. Well, you never know. No, you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> um, you know, um, we've been without a justice on our Supreme Court for over 15 months now. That means that instead of five, there are four members of our court. It's short-staffed. Um, uh, I, um, I can't fathom why we haven't been brought another nominee to vet. 
And the same is true with our um, State Board of Education that had some controversy um, a few months ago. You might remember the governor nominated an individual of color, Ryan Terrell, um, from my town, my city. And after vetting, uh, it was determined that it was not a good fit. But I contacted the governor soon after that nomination failed and said that I have two uh, women who I'd like you to consider. Both of them are women of color. I've known them both for over 30 years. One of them is a tenured professor at a university and a ordained minister, um, as unlikely as that sounds, but yes. And she would be excellent. Another one um, I've known for over 30 years would be good. I also understand that uh, someone else who has a doctorate in education and I know who would be wonderful on this State Board of Education has submitted her name. I kept asking the governor at every meeting for an update. Has he vetted these women yet? Uh, where do we stand? It, this is a District 5 uh, appointment. So you might think that the governor would say, since this is from your district, what are your thoughts? Is there someone that you might like to see on the State Board of Education? It's a really important board. Uh, it makes major decisions about uh, education policy in the state. We need a strong uh, State Board of Education to help make the decisions. But there was none of that. I think um, Cecily might have uh, a little bit more on the the uh, Supreme Court uh, okay. justice stuff. Yes, thank you. Um, I first wanted to ask if if your criteria has changed from when you were first on the on the council, you know, in the the early two thousands to your most recent term. Um, has your criteria changed for judicial nominations in terms of um, who, who you're, you're looking to, to vote, vote for? Um, it hasn't changed. I believe that we need um, good, intelligent justices, especially on our Supreme Court, but all of our courts. Um, men and women who believe in precedent and the uh, understanding that precedent um, should play a big role. Um, people who um, have probably, I would say, have had experience in a judicial role, although that's not, that's not um, uh, a certainty for me. Uh, certainly there are uh, people who have served on our judiciary uh, with this distinction who haven't had it, but it's difficult to vet a nominee um, when there haven't been any rulings. Now with this current nominee, um, the Attorney General Gordon McDonald, it was a little bit easier because he had been a political activist um, working for Gordon Humphrey as his chief of staff when Gordon Humphrey was the US Senator and had helped craft some of the policies and some of the bills that the Senator introduced. So we have an indication about his views on certain issues. Um, um, but I believe that we need a balanced court. I don't think we can have a court that's tilted heavily to the right or to the left. And I have questions about political activists serving in, on, in a committee. It seems to me that you may need to make a choice. You want to be a political activist, a candidate, or you want to be a justice. I don't know whether political activists belong on our on our Supreme Court anyway, for sure. Yeah, um, we had we had gotten a hint about where the um, Attorney General stood, and I thought that the lines were being blurred between a separation of church and state. I think that not, that line needs to be distinct and not um, and and clear. And I think that this attorney general showed his hands in favor of vouchers for private education, something that I am opposed to, as is our state constitution. Uh, there's also the issue of choice, which I don't use as a litmus test, but uh, um, I think that um, 
uh, this individual certainly proved himself to be very anti-choice in the bills that he helped uh, the, the U.S. Senator craft. And also there's been um, some uh, voting rights restrictions that this attorney general has, um, has supported. And, and that is a, um, a, a real problem for me. But yeah. mostly it was balance on the court. I have voted for uh, judges that have been conservative. An example is Justice Lynn. I voted for him as a justice and also to be our chief justice, knowing that we would not agree on a lot of the issues, but he brought balance to the court. Now, the governor has um, put on two very conservative justices just in the past couple of years. So that would make the Supreme Court be uh, two, and then there might already be a more conservative justice, Jim Bassett, who I absolutely like and admire who's on there. Um, but that would be three um, very right-wing conservative justices versus one or two that are in the more liberal clamp. Now, now Justice Hicks retires in another year or two. He reaches the age of 70 and you can't serve beyond the age of 70. So that would give Governor Sununu, should he win re-election in November, another choice. And then that would mean a four to one conservative versus liberal versus moderate um, uh, construct on our Supreme Court. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about uh, something that you had said before, and, and you mentioned there about balance on the court. Has the ideology of, of, a, of a judicial nominee been something that you've looked at before, this, this issue of balance, or has this just kind of come up in, in the McDonald nomination? No, I have looked at the issue of balance before and um, have always wanted to have a balanced court system. And we have. And so when the court system has been balanced, it's not as important to vet that particular nominee as far right or far left or moderate. Um, but now the court is out of balance and it makes it that much more important to, for me to make sure that the court is balanced. I'll just do one more follow up on that. Um, so if if you and, and the governor uh, are both reelected and um, he, he brings forth uh, another judicial nominee and it's someone that that you believe is, is out of balance um, with with the with the court. Um, how long would you feel comfortable with that vacancy, as you mentioned before, that vacancy on the Supreme Court? Well, I don't feel comfortable with the vacancy now. I think that um, in the past, when there has been a, a need to appoint a chief justice or a new justice, it has never gone this long, for sure. And it's usually done within several months. So um, one of the things that is objectionable to me is that there has been, for the last 20 years or so, an impartial judicial selection committee that has vetted these nominees and has suggested to whichever governor is in power several nominees and the governor gets to pick. So the committee has done the vetting um, and, and has suggested to the governor nominees that might fit the criteria of who we need on the Supreme Court now, and the governor picks. And, and I have found it, um, uh, I have found that that works very well, but this governor has disbanded that and is not using a, uh, a nonpartisan impartial group to do the vetting. So uh, he essentially picked his own uh, people to vet candidates. Uh, but isn't that, I, I, it, my recollection was that that is pretty much what John Lynch did and, and what Gene Shaheen did. Uh, who was picking those members of the commission when they were governor? Um, I believe they picked them, but when you look at the list of names, 
there were Republicans, there were Democrats, there were jurists, uh, there were lawyers on it, and a very well-regarded committee. Now, when you look at this committee, they're mostly far-right Republicans, and we even had a lot of problems finding out the names of the people who are on this Judicial Selection Committee. But it certainly isn't nonpartisan, and it's not impartial. Hmm. Okay. Um, Mia? All right. Um, I wanted to ask about spending. Um, how would you approach any future um, emergency funding from the federal government related to the coronavirus um, pandemic in, in light of the way the current governor has sort of um, bypassed some of the traditional um, oversight that might be given to spending? So I have been objecting to the governor spending this money without a review by the fiscal committee and by the executive council. I think it's a, uh, an unconstitutional power grab. I don't think he gets um, any, um, um, any help for this in, when you look at the Constitution. When, you, when I looked at the Constitution, Article 56 says, no money shall be issued out of the treasury of this state and disposed of except sums as may be appropriated for the redemption of bills or credit, treasurer's notes, or for the payment of interest arising thereon, but by warrant under the hand of the governor for the time being, by and with the advice and consent of the council, for the necessary support and defense of this state, and for the necessary protection and preservation of the inhabitants, therefore, agreeably to the acts and resolves of the general court. Now, I think the governor feels like he's getting the power to do this from a 2002 bill that was passed by the legislature that says, and this is just um, uh, part C, to perform and exercise such other functions, powers, and duties as are necessary to promote and secure the safety and protection of the civilian population. So this was passed right after 2001, when we thought that there might be an insurgency, that they might need to call out the National Guard. We weren't sure what was gonna happen after the 2001 attacks. So I think the legislature passed this thinking, we need, um, we need some powers to the governor in case there's an insurgency, a threat. But I don't think what we're facing now qualifies under this provision. He thinks it does. Um, if I had $10,000 to $12,000, I'd add my name to the suit because I think that we would have standing in the courts given what our constitutional duties are and given the fact that we can meet as a council on a moment's notice to approve any money that needs to go out. But to just be summarily, summarily given a list of organizations where the governor is going to spend $1.25 billion by his own decision um, with the advice uh, of a group that he has put together um, goes way beyond what is written in our constitution. And I have objected to all of this spending every council meeting. Um, it doesn't go anywhere, but I feel like I need to put into words uh, my objection to it. You know, I, I might not disagree with much of the spending, but my job is to vet the spending, to make sure that it's going to the right place, to make sure that if we can, it's going um, to a few different organizations uh, that might be doing the same thing. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be giving money, $65,000 to an organization that is a sham um, women's organization, uh, pregnancy counseling group uh, that counsels women against their options, uh, for, for example. Um, just one follow up to that. Um, is there anything that you can do aside from simply voicing your opposition to this uh, to sort of force the issue into the forefront a little bit? I'm all ears, Mia, if you have a suggestion. I was asking you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else I could do. I suppose I could go to court. Um, I'm talking to a lawyer now who might be willing to do it pro bono, but by then, most of the money might be spent. Now, if we get 
another influx of money, and I'm hoping we do because I think our state needs it, um, I'm going to do something like that. All right, I'm, I'm just gonna go, Bill. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was gonna suggest that. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so back in 2018, which maybe was two years ago, maybe was a hundred years ago, hard to tell these days. Um, but when we when we talked to you, you, you were you said you you came out of retirement, so to speak, um, to run after uh, President Trump's election in 2016. And so, uh, just wondering, you know, what's prompting you to to run for re-election now in in a pretty demanding position? Um. It is pretty demanding. Um, you're right. Um, I feel like my work is not done on the council yet. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, redistricting was done in 2010. My opponent, who I'm running against this time, was a big factor in removing Keene from the district. Keene and Nashua had been together in the same council district for 100 years or so. And because of the actions of my opponent, Keene was removed and put into another um, very odd district that was supposed to be the only Democratic district out of the five of us. So most of the Democratic towns are gerrymandered into that district that runs from the Vermont mass border all the way over to the main border. Um, and so I would like to have a say in this upcoming redistricting, certainly to put Keene back in the district where I think it belongs, along with Winchester and Hinsdale, were, which were also taken out, and to have it more fairly put together. So I hope to have a say in that. Um, I also look at where my opponent stands on issues that are very important to me. Um, uh, issues like the rail funding, issues like a woman's right to choose, issues like domestic violence, education voucher issues. Uh, I think I'm on the side where most of the people in my district are on those issues. And I feel like um, I need to continue on, at least for another two years if I can get reelected, to make sure the issues that are most important to me and to my constituents remain on the forefront and are voted in. I might also add uh, energy issues as well. Can I just interject a quick follow-up? Uh, your interest in having a say in uh, redistricting, how would you as an executive counselor actually have a say in that? The House and the Senate put it together. So I would use whatever contacts I have in the House and the Senate to try to reestablish the district that was um, uh, in place before 2010. You know, the district did not have to be changed at all. Usually you change a district because the population shifts, um, you might need to add a few more towns to the North Country if people move out of the North Country. Um, but our district did not have to change at all. It was at the right population and could have stayed the same. I, I also think that I have, um, most of my district is in Hillsborough and Cheshire counties, but I have one town for no reason that I can determine, the town of Dunbarton, which is just southwest, south and west of Concord in my district for some reason. I don't think that belongs. I think the interest is Dunbarton stays with the Concord area. And um, the only reason it came to me is that they needed one more town to put into this district to make the population work out. But I should have towns like um, uh, Dublin and a lot of other towns that I don't now have because the district goes cuts way up to Dunbarton, goes south and west, and then cuts along a line uh, to the south. It, it also includes Swansea, which has always been in the district, but Swansea and Keene, you'd think would have a lot of the same interests. And wouldn't the same counselor represent Swansea in addition to Keene? So I'd like to have a say in how that's done. 
I tried to have a say in 2010, but I was out of office and not many people wanted to listen to me, not to mention the fact that there were, it was, uh, during that year we were overrun by right wing and free state or Republicans. And so um, they were not going to listen to a former democratic counselor who they hoped to eliminate completely in the future by a change in the district. So I, ho I hope that, that, that answers your question. Um, on the topic of representing the constituents in your district, um, one of the things that the Executive Council does is uh, holds um, hearings in each of its district to discuss the 10-year transportation plan. What have you heard from your uh, constituents in District 5 about what their priorities are in terms of transportation? Well, certainly I hear a lot about the need to continue to talk about and to implement rail, um, especially over in the eastern part of my district, perhaps not so much over where you are, but that is a big topic here. Um, uh, uh, you know, I hear that, um, and, and we are moving forward with a project in the Jaffrey area. I don't know whether any of you have driven through Jaffrey, but there's this dog leg um, and they're planning to remove the dog leg with a, um, a circum, um, a, um, one of those round things that cars go around, a roundabout. <laughs> and um, I have been a supporter of this. It has been on the radar of the Department of Transportation for, I'd say 15 or 20 years and was in the 10 year highway plan when we were then using it as a 30 year highway plan. So that has been an important um, issue for me. I have been to the public hearings on that, uh, even though I'm out of office, I was out of office and um, have supported that. Uh, and it looks like that is going to move ahead within the next year or two. Uh, there are always issues about new roads. There's a, um, a project um, over in Hudson, which is now a part of my district, um, to turn the um, green, green, um, green Meadow golf course into a huge facility for Amazon. And there are a lot of concerns about a new road there and what that would do to traffic, especially truck traffic. So I'm still trying to learn about that. That is not in the 10 year highway plan, um, but um, I'm trying to learn about that and to see whether they feel, people feel favorably about it. So far, I have concerns and I've heard from other people who, who live in the general area of this golf course and have grave concerns about the number of huge trucks that will be coming and going and a new road needed for that. Um, but one of the reasons we go out to have public hearings is to hear what our constituents have to say. And um, even though the 10 year highway plan has been written, it's been my thought that if a group of constituents have concerns about a road or would like to see a road or lights or stop signs or something, that the plan can be changed um, a bit each two years. And so I hold uh, four or five public hearings in my district. I used to hold one in Keene when I was over there. Um, I might mention that my opponent refused to hold a public hearing in Nashua this, when he was in office um, the time before, 2016 to 2018. Um, I don't know why, but Nashua is the largest city, the largest community in, in the district and why he wouldn't want to hold a public hearing even though Nashua wanted one is beyond me. So one of the places I will definitely hold a public hearing is um, Nashua. And then probably over to the, toward your area and maybe even in conjunction with whoever the counselor is in that district, we might hold a joint hearing. Um, I certainly would want to come to Keene's if, um, if there was one scheduled in Keene. I, I call myself Keene's second executive counselor even though you already have one, people in Keene sort of know that I'm the second one. And if they have concerns, they're welcome to call me. And I am in touch with some of the residents of Keene sometimes. Thank you. 
Yes. All right. We appreciate that, Deb. Um, I, I, maybe you're going to end up having to uh, arm wrestle with the District 2 counselor if a redistricting is, uh, is going forward to see who gets keen um, in a couple of years. You, I better met, bulk up my arm then. I better get this arm in good shape. There you go. <laughs> well, you mentioned in the, the transportation plan that at one point it was a, more of a 30-year plan than a 10-year plan. Um, but it is rewritten every couple of years, and uh, things seem to move up and down on the priority list. Um, is is the way it's done now an, an effective process for getting things accomplished, or uh, are there any Im improvements or changes you'd make to that? Um. Well, first of all, I have a great deal of respect for the people that work at the Department of Transportation and come out to our meetings with us. And I also think we have an excellent commissioner in the Department of Education in Victoria Sheehan. She is um, willing to uh, talk to anyone at any time about concerns. Um, the uh, I think that what we've done with the 10-year highway plan is good in that um, you don't want to promise a community that something is going to get done in eight or nine years. And then because it ends up being a 15, 20, 25, 30 year plan, it doesn't get done during that time. So I think it's a lot more honest in, um, in, its, um, in its implementation because towns need to know when, when a particular um, uh, project is going to be started, when the engineering is going to be done, when the final review is going to be done, and when it's going to eventually get done. So I, I like the idea that it's now a 10-year highway plan. Um, I think it's difficult to move things up and down on the plan. I don't think it's easy, especially if it's a large item. But if there is an emergency in a particular place, and there are emergencies in places that come up. We try to work with the Department of Transportation to see maybe there is a pot of money, maybe there's some federal money coming in that can be directed at a particular project, especially if it isn't a five, 10, 15, $20 million project. If it's a couple of hundred thousand dollars, it might be able to move up if there is a concern and especially a safety concern in a particular area. And we are looking at a couple of those in my district. Well, you, you probably remember when um, uh, Hinsdale was in your district uh, that there's a bridge over the, the river to Brattleboro that they were planning to do. And that's still uh, on the plan. <laughs> Uh, so it, it it does show that the, the the plan can can be pretty far out um, beyond ten years. Um, so project. was part of the problem that Vermont needed to pay for a certain part of that bridge. I you know I'm trying to remember it. I I'm not sure. I think the the most recent um, stumbling block is that the, the, they need to acquire property in on the Vermont side um, uh, for the project uh, that and that hasn't been done yet uh, so it, it is on that that end of it but it just goes to show how long these projects can uh, can take to come to fruition yeah is that a very expensive project I don't remember but bridges generally over the Connecticut River tend to be really expensive yeah, I, I, I can't remember the dollar figure, but it is, uh, it, it, it's certainly a multi-million dollar uh, uh, project. And, and there is that consideration too, that, uh, you know, we're in a, a year where uh, the gas tax, which pays for a lot of transportation uh, projects, uh, may not net as much uh, as would have been expected going into the budgeting cycle uh, because people haven't been driving as much and uh, there may be some other uh, revenue streams that aren't uh, as forthcoming as have been expected. And so I guess that's going to put some pressure on uh, figuring out what can get done in that 10-year transportation plan 
if those revenues are uh, far short of what was planned for. Um, yes, I, I, I think you're right. Yeah. So something to look forward to if you're reelected. <laughs> yeah, and I can get Winchester back where it belongs. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So is there anything else that um, that you wanted to get across to, to voters um, before we let you go? Um, well, um, I work really hard for my district and for the state um, at large. Uh, a constituent service has always been a big part of my job. And, you know, although we haven't talked a lot about that, I can get a call at any time from a business or from a town or from an individual that has a problem with a state agency. And a good part of my time is in talking to these peoples and businesses and, um, and towns to see what the problem is and try to work out a, an amicable solution with a state agency. And I could give you a lot of examples, but you know, they have to do with people becoming homeless, um, uh, problems at um, uh, trailer parks. Um, uh, uh, for instance, there's, there's, there hasn't been a uh, country store in my town of Francistown for years. And this year, there is a store coming on board, but they have problems with the with certain departments getting permits. And so I've been able to help them a little bit, speed up that process a little bit. And now the store is open. I haven't been there yet, but I'm going for a sandwich sometime soon. Um, but but it can have it, it can be vast, you know, the requests and the for example, um, this morning I got a call from somebody who was really frazzled and has a, has a problem with the Department of Environmental Services and what she feels they're trying to do with uh, a property that she owns. And so I was on the phone this morning with Bob Scott, our commissioner, to try to have an understanding. And of course, I only heard her part of it. I got a different uh, take from, from Mr. Scott, Commissioner Scott, and but I'm still trying to work out some kind of a solution, some kind of a compromise. And usually there's that available. If, um, if you stick with it and if you have reasonable people discussing things. Um, I really would like your endorsement. I've had it for quite some time. I really would like it. Even though I don't have Keene anymore, I still have Swansea and Richmond and Troy and some of the other towns around Fitzwilliam that are in Cheshire County. Yes, yeah, you absolutely do. And, and we appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with us and, and let people know a little bit more about your perspectives on things. Of course, yeah. And if you, uh, Mia and Cicely, are you the writers? So if you have any other questions, please feel free to give me a call on my cell phone and I can give you that number. That'd be great. Six it's just Mia. What was that? I was just gonna say Mia is, is the reporter, so it's all on her. Oh, it's all on you. Oh, okay, Mia. So it's uh, 557-1304, or you can email me, Deb at debpignatelli.com. And so can any of my constituents that might be listening. Well, they, they can now. <laughs> I'm glad that this is going to be up so that um, uh, people who are going to be voting can be informed about um, the person they're voting for. All right. Well, good luck. Thank you. And thank you for being a newspaper to which we can be proud. Thank you very much for taking time. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you too. Take care, all of you. Stay safe. Get your flu shots. Stay healthy.